Good morning, and welcome to Black Rock Church. <clears throat> I'm Tim Carley, along with our amazing choir. I want, uh, we welcome you this morning. Won't you stand and sing with us the praise to the Lord, uh, the Almighty.
remain standing, could we say together the 23rd Psalm? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He make me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please be seated. Good morning, my name is Van, and I want to welcome you to Black Rock Church. If this is your first time here, I want to thank you for choosing Black Rock as your place to worship and come closer to God. We're excited that you're here. If you're new or if you haven't connected with us yet, I want to encourage you to stop by the Connection Center to pick up a gift and let us know that you are here. Ladies, Women's Weekend is coming quickly. Join us May 3rd through 5th at Harbor Cedars Bible Conference in New Jersey. This will be a special weekend to gather together as women of all generations and walks of life to connect with God and become more rooted in Christ through worship, messages, testimonies, prayer, and encouragement. We will grow together in our faith and equip each other to share the love of Jesus with our families, friends, community, and throughout the world. Invite a friend to join you and register for a room together. Visit the booth in the Welcome Center to ask questions and register, or visit our website at blackrock.org slash info. Thank you again for joining us today. Now let's continue in a time of prayer and worship. Once again, let's stand and sing, I Sing the Mighty Power.
As we prepare for uh, prayer, I want to remind you that we are praying for our missionaries, especially today, uh, the Hunt family as they serve in France, working with Muslim and Arab refugees, and as they are preparing for uh, language school as well. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for all of our global partners around the nations, around the globe, as they serve you, as they have given their lives to service of others, that they may know the one and true living God. We pray for Matthew and Molly Hunt and their family, Lord, as they're in France. We ask that as they continue to learn to speak French, Lord Jesus, you would give them extra grace in learning the language. We pray for Ava, especially as she starts school and she transitions into uh, not only a foreign language, but a culture as well. May she and all the Hunt family make good friends. May they have uh, expanded wisdom as their team continues to grow. But most of all, Jesus, we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would open up doors of people's hearts, not only in France, but in Arab nations around the world to know you, Jesus. Lord, we also pray that you be with Deborah Belt as she prepares for surgery this Wednesday. We ask that your peace and your comfort and your healing to be upon her, Lord. Lord, we also ask that you be with Susie and Jeff Keeler and Todd Crewold as their families gather together this Saturday to celebrate the life of their mom, Holly. Lord, we ask that you would continue to bring them comfort, but also that Holly's legacy of service here at Black Rock would continue to produce the harvest that you deserve and that she desired. Jesus, we pray all these things for your glory, and in your name we pray, amen. Let's continue our worship by standing and singing, Fairest Lord Jesus, and this is my Father's world. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm sorry, Debbie. Debbie's going to read scripture. I'd like to read from Psalm 119, 73 through 80. Your hands have made me and formed me. Give me understanding so that I can learn your commands. Those who fear you will see me and rejoice, for I put my hope in your word. I know, Lord, that your judgments are just and that you have afflicted me fairly. May your faithful love comfort me as you promised your servant. May your compassion come to me so that I may live. For your instruction is my delight. Let the arrogant be put to shame for slandering me with lies. I will meditate upon your precepts. Let those who fear you, those who know your decrees, turn to me. May my heart be blameless regarding your statutes so that I will not be put to shame. What kind of a man can heal the pain with a single soft touch? What kind of a man multiplies hope and freedom as easily as he does fish and bread? Who else can turn our dusty old religion into a brand new relationship? What kind of man would claim to be God in the flesh, but then allow that same flesh to be torn apart? What kind of a man would embrace betrayal? Insults. Torture. Mockery and death, and yet live to tell about it. Nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus. Nobody. Who could speak with such authoritative words and yet drench them with compassion? Who could be strong enough to still the storms yet be so meek and humble? Who could allow the hands that created the universe to also be nailed into a wooden cross? Who could choose patience despite deserving immediate and complete obedience? Who could be blameless and without fault, but still endure the judgment others deserve? Nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus. Nobody. Who will love us like him? Who will be with us when all others have left? Who comforts us in suffering? Who is our peace in 
in the midst of anxiety? Who reassures me when my mind is drowning in doubt? Who accepts me as I am, with no strings attached? Who else would die for me while I was sinking in sin? Who else can turn the grave into Easter morning? Nobody. 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 Nobody but Jesus. I almost hesitate coming out here. Let, <clears throat> let's stand now and sing Fairest Lord Jesus, and this is my Father's world.
You may be seated. Good morning, Black Rock. I'm Pastor Kevin, and I'm part of the team here at Black Rock, and I'm so glad to be with you. How many of you were here last week? And you came back. Well done. Good job. I want to tell you a story. My wife and I, in 2019, had the immense privilege of being able to go to uh, Israel, to go to the Holy Land. How it happened was, is my dad called me up and said, Kevin, your mom and I are going to Israel, and we think every pastor should be able to go to the Holy Land once in their life, so we wanna pay for you to go. And I was overwhelmed by that generosity. And I said, oh, that would be amazing, Dad. And he said, yes, we're gonna go with our retirement community in which they live, and we'd love to have you go with us. And I was in my mid-40s at the time, and I said, that would be phenomenal. So we got a chance to spend 10 days on a bus uh, traveling all over Israel, that, and the bus was Carrie and I, and uh, uh, the rest of the 40 or 50 people on the trip were in their 70s, 80s, and even 90s. And it was a blast. We had a great time. It wasn't a fast-moving trip, but it was a great group to be with. And there was one particular day that I was sitting, uh, eating lunch with a group of about five or, or six of, of, the, of men, and around the table, most of them were in their 80s, and they were swapping stories of their life experiences and all that they would do, and I would ask them questions about where they worked and what they had done and what they had seen in life, and I just loved it, sitting down with the table of these people uh, from the greatest generation. And one particular day, I was, at, I was sitting with them. They were, they were expounding on different things, and finally, one of them said, his name was Dave, and he was about 85 years old, and he looked me serious in the eyes and he said, Kevin, I've got one piece of life advice for you as you enter this final stage of life. Now, I wasn't prepared for that anyways, but he said, as you get older and you move into our age bracket, I've got one piece of life advice for you. And I, I'm sitting at the edge of my seat waiting for this pearl of wisdom to be dropped into my lap. Uh, these men have been married for 50, 60 years and and." and I was like, uh, on my seat, and he goes, I've got one piece of advice. And I'm thinking, he's narrowed down 80 years into one piece of advice. I, I'm ready to pull out you know, uh, my journal and start writing this down, because I want to remember this one thing. And he looked me dead in the eyes. He said, Kevin, invest in a really good nose hair trimmer, because <laughs> you're going to need it. Now, that story has no point. <laughs> But we're gonna look again today at stories Jesus told. These stories are what are often referred to as parables. They were stories that Jesus told that had a point. They were a teaching thing. And we're, we've looked at that last week of what the point is. And Jesus was always in his stories trying to shift the perspective and the belief system of the people that he was listening, that were listening to him so that their hearts and minds would be aligned with who God was and what he had for them. And last week, we looked at four things that a spiritual mentor shared with me that are really important, and I believe at the heart of what Jesus was trying to share with his believers. And these things are that what we believe affects what we, how we perceive. How we perceive affects what we're able to receive. And what we receive affects what we're able to walk out and achieve in our life with Jesus. And Jesus was trying to share these stories to affect that the fact that what they believe was in line with the word in the heart of God and they could receive all that God had for them. That they could walk all that God wanted in their purposes of life with Jesus. And that's why he told these stories to affect how they saw themselves, God, the kingdom of God and the people around them. So last week, I, I put up a picture, if you were, were here last week, of the plates that were all upside down. I've got another one for you we're gonna try today. 
So if we can put the picture up, I want you to look at it in this pile of rocks. And eventually will emerge a message. You may have to squint. You may have to stand on your head. You may have to unfocus. But when you see the words in the rocks, raise, just raise your hand so you can see it. Great. Great. Last week, I said if you couldn't see it, it's because you were more intelligent than the rest of us. This week, you need to eat more green leafy vegetables, apparently. Get some carrots for vitamin K for your eyes. Once you see it, you won't be able to unsee it because in it contain the words of scripture that Jesus refers to as well. And it says, these stones will cry out. These stones will cry out. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Uh, I saw people walk in when we were putting the picture up before, and as soon as they said, oh, I see it, because they had seen it before. But then others, it took a while to, for the picture to emerge. And that's what Jesus does with these parables. And we're gonna look at a new parable today, a new story that Jesus told, and it's short. It's one of the shortest, but it's unbelievably powerful. Will you join with me in turning to Luke chapter seven as I read this parable? Starting in verse 40. So Jesus answered him, talking to Simon. Simon, I have something to say to you. He replied, say it, teacher. Jesus continued, a certain creditor had two debtors. One owed him 500 silver coin and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose, the one who had the bigger debt canceled. Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. You have judged rightly. This parable is often called the parable of the two debtors. And so let me give you a little bit of insight that Jesus listeners would have understood. He, he, Jesus referred to that there's two guys who owed someone money, a creditor money. Some of us can relate to that as well, whether they're a bank or a credit card company or someone. But uh, he says one of them owed them 50 silver coins and the other one 500. Now, these silver coins were called denarii. And they were worth, one silver coin was worth about a day's wages in Jesus' time. So one uh, owed him 50 day's wages, the other one 500. Now let me put that into uh, 21st century American Western context dollar wise. That would be about the 50 silver coins, the 50 denarii would be about $15,000. Now that's a lot of money, am I right? If you say no, can we be friends? <laughs> um, but $15,000 is a lot of money. But the other guy owed 500 denarii, $500 wages. That would be about the equivalent uh, in our time of how much money would be about $150,000. That's a whole lot of money. And so that's the story that Jesus is telling. It's a very simple one. It's a very straightforward parable. It's a very short one. And it makes sense. And even Simon says he thinks it's so easy. He can't answer the question with confidence. He goes, I suppose because it's gotta be more than that, but I'll try to give the right answer. And Jesus said, well done, you, you've answered rightly. When I was in college, I, I went to school in New York and uh, in New York State, right on the Hudson River. And my dorm that I stayed in was the farthest dorm out from all of the classes. And most of my classes were at the other end of campus. It was also a campus that had lots of hills. It was right on the Hudson River. So the weather was full of wind. It was often cold in the winter. It would rain a lot. And that's all to say uh, that I did not like walking to class. And so I often would drive my car to my classes, which is not that big of a deal, except that you could only park certain places in my college. And so where I had classes was not one of those places that I could park. I did not have a parking pass for that. Now, don't judge me, but I was young and dumb. Now I'm just older. And so regularly I would fall into the temptation of driving my car up there 
hoping that campus security would bypass my car, would not notice that my car was not where it needed to be. And can I tell you, they never did. I would regularly get parking tickets on my car. And I was a young college student who had very little money, and so I wasn't great at paying those parking tickets, I have to be told. And there may or may not have been a stack of them in my glove compartment. At the end of the school year in April, I got a letter in my campus mailbox, and it said, Dear Mr. Butterfield, you have accumulated over $400 worth of parking tickets. Either pay them today, or we will remove your car from campus until you can pay the bill. Well, $400 to me was a whole lot of money. I was about $395 short. (laughs) And so I was trying to figure out what I could do. There was no way I was asking mom or dad to bail me out of that trouble. And so I did what I could only do, and I went into the campus security office, and I went to the head of the campus security. His name was Rich. He was not really well-liked on campus, not because of anything bad he did, but because he got, we got in trouble for anything bad we did through Rich. And I came into his office, and I said, Rich, I got your letter, and I don't know what to do. I don't have that kind of money, so if you give me a little grace, I'll get my car off of campus. So please don't tow it, and I'll find a way to pay you back by the end of the semester. Please, you know, I wasn't asking for justice, I was asking for mercy. And Rich looked me in the eyes and he said, Kevin, thanks for coming. I appreciate that. He said, you know what? Don't worry about it. I said, don't worry about getting my car towed? He said, don't worry about the bill. And he ripped it up and threw it in the trash. Can I tell you something? I love that guy. I love that guy. My entire perspective of him changed forever. And when everyone, anyone complained about campus security, I was the first one to defend them. Why? Because that's the heart of what Jesus is trying to show in this parable, but a hundred times more. We don't fully understand this parable until we understand the context in which Jesus told this parable. I want you to imagine for a second that there was a dinner party thrown for Jesus, and it was thrown by a guy named Simon. He was a Pharisee, and the Pharisees were still checking out Jesus to see if they liked him or didn't, and most of them didn't like Jesus because of the things he did or said or taught, or how he did that, but Simon was at least willing to invite him into a house party with the rest of his Pharisee friends. Jesus was there with his disciples, just checking Jesus out. But then, someone shows up and crashes Simon's party. In the midst of this scene, you see a woman bust through the door. She found where Jesus was. And it says in the passage that she stood behind Jesus and Jesus was reclining at the table and his feet were there. And Jesus uh, was sitting there, probably startled a bit, but the rest of the guests definitely were. And this woman falls at the feet of Jesus. And it says in the passage that she was weeping. This woman was weeping. And that word doesn't mean just tears gently rolling down your face like a sad movie, this means loud wailing and crying as tears flowed. Her tears fell on Jesus' feet and everyone in the room could hear what was happening. They could see what was happening. And this woman is described as someone who had lived a sinful life or was a sinner. So we know that Simon, the rest of his guests, knew who this woman was and what she was known for was not good. And here she is wailing, ugly crying over Jesus' feet and pouring out her tears. And then as her tears hit Jesus' feet, she pulls out her hair, which would have been seen as inappropriate for a woman to do in a public place, especially around men. But she pulls down her hair and she starts wiping Jesus' feet because she soiled them with 
her tears and how even her tears and dirt mixed together and washing down Jesus' feet. And then she opens up a jar of alabaster ointment and she begins to anoint Jesus' feet. And now the room is full with not only the sights and the sounds of this woman, but now the smells of this alabaster jar as she pours them out over her feet. And then she kissed his feet repeatedly over and over and over again. And Jesus received this. Jesus took this act and didn't push her away or stop her in any way. He received her weeping and adoration and even her worship. Why would she do this? It's in the midst of this scene as this woman is doing this that Jesus tells this story. Because I'm sure Simon, as we're gonna see, and everyone else would say, why would this woman do something like this in a public place? This is so inappropriate. This is crossing so many cultural boundaries. Why would she do this and why would Jesus receive it? And in the midst of that, we find the nugget as Jesus tells this story. And here's the spiritual principle that we can all have right now. Why would she do this? Because gratitude is the natural expression of forgiveness. Gratitude is the natural expression of forgiveness. And this woman was so gracious and so filled with gratitude. And it's in this that Jesus responds to what was in Simon's heart because Simon said to himself, if he was really a prophet, it was, if he was really from God, if he is really the Messiah that others claimed him to be, then he would know exactly who this woman is, exactly what she's done, exactly what she's like, and he would refuse this and send her out of here in shame. And then Jesus tells the story of the two debtors. Not to expose the woman, but to expose the heart of Simon. And after he tells the story that we just read in verse 44, it says this, then turning toward the woman, as he looks at the woman, he says to Simon, do you see this woman? Do I see her? I see her, I hear her, I smell her. I can't escape this scene. But Jesus said, did you see this woman? I entered the house. You gave me no water to wash my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss of greeting. But from the time I entered, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfumed oil. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Thus, she loved much, but the one who is forgiven little loves little. Let me read that again. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Thus, she loved much, but the one who is forgiven little loves little. The two characters in this context, and really are the two characters of Jesus' parable. Simon was probably the one who owed 15, and she was the woman who owed 500 silver coins. But the difference between Simon and this woman was not the amount of sins that they committed, but the amount of forgiveness that they were willing to receive, and then therefore love and gratitude would be expressed. Simon was self-righteous. He thought that all the things that he had done for God, for others, all the right decisions that he made, made him righteous. Therefore, he was self-righteous and even before God. But this woman was different. She knew she could never be self-righteous. But she falls at the feet of the one who could make her righteous because of what Jesus had done 
and who Jesus was. She was made righteous by Jesus. I believe that gratitude, much like love, is made complete when expressed. In other words, you can have gratitude in your heart towards someone, but it becomes most complete and most full when you express that gratitude towards a person, whether in words or in acts or in gifts, somehow your gratitude gets expressed to the person that is worthy of the gratitude. This woman expresses her love and forgiveness and gratitude in full. Here's the paradigm shift. Here's where everything changes. It's this. When I realize the extravagance of God's grace and forgiveness towards my wretchedness, towards my sin, I can only respond with the extravagance of gratitude and worship. The paradigm shift comes when I see that I'm that woman. I'm that woman. And so are you. The difference between you and I and the world around us, no matter what we see on TV or what we see around us, or the people that we've worked with or the sinners around us, is not the amount of our sin. In God's eyes, we've all sinned. And even our righteous works are like filthy rags before him until we receive grace, mercy, and forgiveness. I'm that woman. So are you. Imagine if today was this dinner party and Jesus is here. Who are you? Are you Simon? Giving God reserved expressions of thanks and gratitude and maybe if you're like me at times, I feel like Simon where I see myself as righteous and if I compare myself to others around me, it's easy to find someone who has more sin in their account until I realize the weight of my own sin, the offense that I've brought before God. If what was in my heart at times or in my mind was projected on the screen, the same with you, what would we do and how would we respond? I'm gonna ask Tim and the choir to come back up. And as I do, I want you to think about one thing. This woman expressed an act of gratitude, extravagant, lavish, full of heart and emotion. And everyone around could see her expression of love and gratitude and worship and adoration to Jesus as she worshiped at his feet. That was an act at a dinner. Let me ask you a question. Will your life be an expression of gratitude to the one who paid every sin, to the one who sacrificed his life, to the one who took my sin and your sin upon his shoulders is the one who took the wrath of God so that the love of God could be poured out on us. Last week I said this. We are beloved sons of daughters, and it's true. We've been accepted by God through the forgiveness of sins, through the one, Jesus, who took our place. Does your life reflect mercy, gratitude, thanksgiving? Does the way you treat the Lord at his feet 
and others around you is it a fragrance of mercy and grace because of all that we've been forgiven. May Black Rock be filled with ones who know the cost of their forgiveness. May Black Rock be filled with people who are sinners coming into a place of realization that through Christ, every sin can be wiped out. May Black Rock be filled with people that have a natural expression of gratitude everywhere we go because of what he has done for us. May we live worshiping at his feet and telling everyone about the one who saves. Father, we thank you. And those words aren't nearly enough, but I thank you that we get all of eternity to worship you. But I'm glad that we don't have to wait until heaven. We can do it now and may our worship, may our expression, may our words, may our life and lifestyle be an act of worshiping at your feet. May we pour out it all in gratitude every day to say, I'm an unworthy one who has been made worthy and receive the forgiveness and love of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming this morning. Let's stand and sing our final song, I Surrender All.
Hey, BlackRock, thank you for joining us for worship this morning. I hope that uh, your life was inspired by uh, the stories that Jesus told. And um, I know for me that uh, it's a lot of times I'll hear something impactful and then I'll go throughout my day and not uh, reflect on it. But I want to encourage you today to reflect on what the Lord spoke to you on. So a couple moments to maybe sit outside. It's going to be a beautiful day and uh, reflect on uh, what God is moving in your own spirit and how you can live more like Jesus taught. And uh, and I know the world needs to to see that. The world of turmoil, uh, as I watched last night the news and, and seeing what's happening in the Middle East, my, whole, my heart breaks because I realize that uh, people are so far from the truth of Jesus, but we as Christ followers need to be that witness and that light. And so just encourage you, take some time to think through what God spoke to you and how you can live more like him. Hey, if you're new to uh, BlackRock, you've never been here, I'd love for you to stop by on a Sunday. We are always encouraging those who watch online to join us in person. So if you can do that in the next couple of weeks, love to see you here uh, to worship with us. And uh, one of the things that you heard uh, this morning was we have a women's uh, weekend coming up and encourage you that... Um, Never been on a women's weekend to sign up. I do know that uh, registration usually fills up. So if you're thinking about it, uh, do that sooner than later uh, for our retreat uh, in May. Uh, and then lastly, just want to encourage you, all those uh, of you who have never taken the step of baptism. Uh, baptism is your public decoration of uh Jesus changing your life and your desire to live for him and to be a witness for him. And, and we believe that um, as an adult, all of us should be baptized. This is what Jesus taught us all to take that step of baptism. And so if you've never taken that step of baptism as an adult, uh, check out our website, uh, blackrock.org slash baptism, and uh, see the information there and how you can join uh, in that step of baptism. Uh, publicly declaring your faith in Jesus for the world to know. And uh, that is out of obedience to what Jesus has taught us. And so encourage you if you have never done that before. Hey, encourage you today to step out in faith, to step out in what God has called you to live uh, for him for, and in that uh, to be a witness for him to a lost world that needs to know Jesus. Let me pray as uh, we end. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you have uh, spoken to each and every one of us this morning. And Lord, I pray that uh, out of what we have heard today, out of what you have uh, moved in our spirit in, Lord, I pray that we can uh, live for you in a world that desperately needs to know the truth about you. And so uh, guide us in that. Thank you for ministering to our hearts. And Lord, I pray that out of abund abundance, Lord, that we can uh, live for uh, those around us and serve them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, thanks and have a blessed day.